ladies and gentlemen, Jordan is considered as a part of the Holy Land. Yes. We have too many places here in Jordan mentioned in the Old and the New Testament, and a lot of people, they don't know about it. Like, you know, Bethany, beyond the Jordan, the baptism yeah. site, it's located here in Jordan. Mount Nebo, the last station of Moses, or the first, the first view of Moses to the Promised Land, it's yeah. here in Jordan. Right. Aaron, the brother of Moses, yep. buried in one of the mountains in Petra. We are going to see it, but of course from far distant. Yep. Aaron, the brother of Moses, buried there. And uh, also, uh, uh, Mikawar or Mika uh, Mikarios, where John the Baptist beheaded by Herod Antipas. Yeah. Lot spent also with his uh, two daughters. We're going to talk about it. So many, uh, many, many uh, are a religious site located here in Jordan, and a lot of people they don't know about it. Let me just share something with you that he knows. Prior to 1993, this area was all arid and desert. And so the, the peace treaty between Israel and uh, Jordan is extremely important because it does pump that 20% of the water from the, from the uh, Sea of Galilee where you were and irrigates this side just like it was irrigated on the, on the side of uh, the Israeli side. And so this has really been a very, very good peace treaty because it brings life to this area. And you know, he was talking about, and I won't interrupt him a lot because he's very, very good, but he was talking about the, uh, the wadis. You will be going down to Wadi Musa which is the uh, Valley of Moses. As a matter of fact, there's a spot there where the Bible says the rock followed them and Moses, Moses would actually hit that rock, uh, speak to it, and then hit it once, but he would speak to it and water would flow out and he would, he would actually water, be able to water two and a half million people, it's estimated of, as it, from the Exodus. And so if you, we are studying uh, Genesis, and those of you that are in our Genesis study on Thursday nights, you are back into the land of Genesis. And so uh, most of the things we'll be referring to here are Genesis, although there are some, as he said, New Testament references. So I really want you to understand that this is a really important spot. And I'm thankful that he brought some handouts and some things that he can give you. Uh, when we get down to Petra, you'll see it's the city of the Nabataeans. We'll tell you all about those. But, uh, but understand that you are, you are going down a very, very rich, biblical area not so much the north as much as you get down more towards the south and so uh, just just to let you give you a reference biblically uh, you're gonna have a lot of heavy things coming from Genesis here This is kind of interesting because most people who take to Israel sees this, see this Magdaba map and they never get to see the actual one because the actual one's in Jordan. So you gotta make this trip to see it. So you just see a picture of it and you'll, you'll get really kind of excited when you see it in the streets of Israel. You see in that street where they have that big mosaic a copy of it. You're actually gonna see the, the real thing. Even people who come to Jordan don't get to see this. They just go right to Petra. They go over the Alamy Bridge and they go to Petra. Well, you're coming, you're coming, uh, you're coming in a spot where you're getting to see this and Petra. So most people don't even get to see this. So I don't think I've ever taken a tour to see this. So it's really pretty neat. And again, the reason it's exciting to me is because it's the, it's the earliest map of Jerusalem. And uh, of course, uh, Sammy will tell you, but it's the earliest map of Jerusalem. I just want to emphasize to you that I've, ne I've never taken a tour here to this. Although I've known it's here and I've been here, I've never taken a tour here. 
and so you usually have to show them in Israel, in that west side of Israel where it is, but it is the oldest map of Jerusalem. It shows us where the, where um, one of the main churches is in uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is actually on this map, so it's pretty exciting. soon relatively speaking after the, after Christianity began. And so we'll see the map of Jerusalem that is in here next. This was right here. Okay? This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which you'll go to when you're in Jerusalem. So it's one of the old it is the oldest map. And it's different in several cities that they have of the Middle East. But the, this one is one of the most important ones right here because it gives the layout of Jerusalem. There's only one place in Jerusalem, one of the old places that they did not destroy the pictures, and that is in the Church of the Nativity. I mean, the Church of the Nativity, they left them there because when they were conquering it, when the Persians were coming in and conquering it, they looked, the people, it shows the three wise men, and the three wise men looked like the people who were conquering them because they, they were coming from there. And so they left those three wise men pictures on, and that's the only part we know of in the Holy Land or in Jordan where iconoclasts, they did not come and destroy those spaces. You travel this way, this is where we've been traveling. We've been traveling down this side, the east side of the Jordan River. This is where you stayed last night, way up in here off the map, at the Sea of Galilee. So this is the, remember the map of Israel we had like this? It's just turned like that, okay, so you know that. And the Dead Sea, and over in here, we talked about, we talked about the, the uh, cave, we talked about burial places. That's the cave of Machpelah in the Hebron. Hebron is a spot where, uh, where many of the patriarch's bones are buried, and they're buried there because they believe the resurrection will start there, and Abraham will stand back to life there with Sarah, and uh, Joseph's bones are there, they were brought up from Egypt. So uh, this is a, uh, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm very excited about it because I know so much about this, but this is the map that is really the one you want to center on, which is right over here, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and also the... Uh, the Cardo, the, the main Cardo, the main street. You're going to be in this area when you go to Jerusalem. You're going to be in here. We'll show you the columns that this map, map picks. There's some columns already there, still there. And we'll show you that in there. This is the Agora where they would go. They would actually shop, a little shopping area back in uh, in Jesus' day. So a great map, and uh, you're getting to see it. And I promise you, if you go home and you ask anybody if they went to Israel, first of all, not a whole lot of people went to Israel. Then you ask anybody if they went to Jordan, and a whole lot of people go to Jordan, and they've got Petra. But if you ask how many have seen this map in the actual thing, I promise you, you won't find anybody. It's a very, it's, it's a, they really don't stop here. So. What you'll see is around the borders, you'll see certain animals that are used all the time, like the stork and the peacock. And those were, you're going to see those in a lot of mosaics, especially in Catholic churches. They represent life and, and happiness and prosperity. So you'll see them many, many times, uh, a peacock and storks. 
And that's where you get, by the way, the stork when you see the, the old nursery rhyme of a stork bringing your baby. That's where you get it from. It's this old mosaic. So I told you, everything we get, a lot of things we get, a lot of our traditions come from the old world, whether it's Greco, the Hellenistic world, or whether Roman, or whether it's just even some in the Byzantine and the Catholic, the Catholic symbolism. My friends, first of all, I'm very, very sorry because I can't remember exactly where Moses stopped. Here, here. <laughs> You know, it's uh, 3,000 years ago and uh, I get old, so I can't remember <laughs> exactly. But anyway, this is the last station of Moses. Moses was here before 3,000 years ago, and he saw the uh, Promised Land and he died somewhere. Nobody knows where his tomb, as it mentioned in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 34. Moses lived 120 years. After 30 days, Joshua, he took the Israeli tribe, passing Hashbun Valley, I show you before. Yep. on the way to Madaba and down and then after that crossing Jordan River. I'm very sorry about the view today is not clear because the sun now is starting in the west but if it's the sun in the east you can see it very clear down there Jordan River and beyond it that way you know that Jericho the oldest city in the world. So after the, you know uh, you know the uh, Joshua cross Jordan River continue to Jericho and later to Jerusalem that you know Jerusalem over there. And uh, from here, might you can see the Mount Olive in Jerusalem and the Dead Sea water. You see the Dead Sea down there. After the mountains come, you know, the Dead Sea area. So from here, you can see a part of the Holy Land. Later, if you just look to the sign over there, we get a sign. And that's, you know, show you the direction of the cities which was seen by Moses before 3,000 years ago. All right. But I'm very sorry, really, uh, about the view today. You can use your imagination. You know, you'll be seeing, you're privileged to be able to see both sides of where Joshua has come from. You'll be in Jericho in a couple days. See that side, you'll know he has come from here. So you got two different things going on here. You got Moses, as, as Sammy was saying, you got Moses viewing the promised land. He didn't get, does anybody know why he didn't get to go into the promised land? Because, now let me just teach you just a little bit, okay? God told him to speak to the rock. We know in the New Testament, Jesus is called the rock. If you go in the Old Testament, the rock that followed them is capitalized. It's a proper noun, okay? He was doing a shadow and type. Jesus was supposed to be struck for our sins. You strike it just once. That's the only time you strike it, once. But when he struck it more than once, he was, he was actually ruining the shadow and type that God was setting up for Jesus. Because everything that you see in the Old Testament, most of the stuff you see in the Old Testament, is really plays in to the New Testament. So when he strikes it twice, he does it because the people are complaining. He strikes it twice and, and he ruins the, uh, the symbolism of Christ coming and only being struck, being, being killed once and for all, the Bible says, not over and over again. So he is the, who's the water of life? Jesus. He was struck once. He, he feeds us as the water of life. That's the reason why he was prevented from going into the promised land. He disobeyed and he ruined that, that perfect image, the perfect shadow and type of Christ. And we know that Isaac was an image of Christ. We know that the striking of that rock, that rock that followed him in the wilderness was a, was a type of Christ. And so God was doing something. He wasn't telling people these things just for nothing. He wasn't telling Moses things for nothing. He was building upon something. And even the promised lineage, even the promised seed, Israel, they were promised to do what? To deliver a Messiah so he could save the world. That's why they were promised, the promised nation, promised to deliver the seed that would, that would bring the hope to the entire world. So that's the reason why Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land. What this is called is Nehushtan in the Old Testament. It means bright shining serpent, but think about it. The people had rebelled. The snakes were coming in from the outside of the camp. They were killing people. Uh, they were very deadly. Moses told, take an image of the snake and wrap it around a pole, and whoever looks on the image of the snake will be, will be healed. That is Jesus Christ. He is that sin kills us. It comes from the backside of us. It kills us. It tries to, it tries to hurt us. He who knew no sin became sin hung on a pole. So there you see Jesus in the Old Testament, the shadow of him in the Old Testament through the Nishtan. Now, this had to be broken. The sh bright shining serpent had to be broken because the people wanted to, wanted to actually worship it. It's another reason why God buried Moses someplace around here because, because what Joshua says is, is that they would have taken Moses' bones and his body and they would have worshiped him. It's just like when you come to the Promised Land, I've seen people take pieces of the mosaic or they've taken this off of a wall and basically it becomes something holy to them. This is a great spot, but your holiness, the Bible tells us, is inside you, okay? It's not on a rock, okay? This is wonderful. So this is a lot of imagery that you see from the Old Testament to the New Testament.
They had to depend on God for their daily bread. So they just ate straight bread? Bread and water. Except for one time, they got all the bird they could eat. Quail. It actually came out of their noses. Quail? Yeah, what happened is they complained to Moses because of the manna. Everything was manna. I'm sure they had a bunch of recipes on how to cook manna because that's all they had. And they complained and God sent a, the God sent a wind and in the wind came quail. They wanted meat. And it, it says that it went up to their knees in quail. And they ate it and they got sick and they actually threw it up out of their noses, the Bible says. He's in the cross over the Jordan River and to go into, into Canaan at that time, which is, which is Israel. But you know, you have this, the, the Jordan River is swollen over its banks. It's a time of harvest time. And he goes near the fertile area. Remember, when he's coming in by Jericho, Jericho is really on the bottom, right where the, right where the Dead Sea forms. He's not going down over this way. Okay. He's going that way and it's plush. Okay. Okay. Moses died when he was 120. 100. So he was probably 120. By the way, he had six more sons when he, when he was 120. Uh, by the time he was 120. Mm -hmm. Mentioned in scripture, but there's a, there's a um, tradition that says that Moses also had six sons. And there's something in that number six that it was attached with, uh, with Abraham. They were wicked sons, the Bible says. But Moses, it's taught, like Gershom was his son, but, and he, he circumcised him and his wife called him a bloody man. But there's some tradition in the Tanakh that says that he had other sons. I think it was six. I may be wrong in six, but he had some other sons. Up, up from, they think, from 100 to 120. But Abraham definitely had him. She was right. You know, I don't want you to mislead you, but it is a tradition that says he had some sons. I think it was six, but I'm not sure. the mountains of Seir, S-E-I-R, the mountains of Petra, and you're in, the, you're in Jordan, you're on the east side of the Dead Sea, and you'll be going back to the, the, the Edomite, Edomite Mountains, and that is the Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses. So the children of Israel came in that valley over on that side and wandered their way up to where we were in Mount Nebo and came across and went all the way up to Mount Nebo and then from Mount Nebo, Moses died, couldn't go into the promised land. Joshua took him down from Mount Nebo, went further north to across from where Jordan is where we're gonna cross by the bridge tomorrow and took him across the flooded Jordan River. The bus is going to continue down, passing through the city of Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses. That's the city of uh, the Wadi Musa. Now, the one who likes to ride a horse, you ride it from uh, the pink color down there to the entrance of the narrow canyon. You see a, lo a lot of people are down there. And uh, you see the Bedouin tent over there. That's, you know, the entrance of the narrow canyon. You see the distance from the uh, pink color building to the entrance of the narrow canyon. Uh, if you look to my hand, you can see it's only just half meters. Now it's only just half mile. So the one who like we can do it, we can walk it. As you see it, it's easy. 
All right. Now, once we get over there, we get the dam. We're gonna start the tour going through the narrow canyon or what we call a seek. Of course, from here, you can't see any monuments. All the monuments, it's in the other side and among the mountains. So from here, you can't see any monuments or the caves. And then after that, we go through the narrow canyon till the end of the narrow canyon or the seek. We're gonna reach the treasury. You see the red, you know, or the pink color of the mountain, the top. That's the top of the treasury over there. And then after that, we're gonna keep going down to the end of the valley. Now, Aaron Tomb, from here, you can see the white little things. That's her mountain up there. All right. Now, the village, you see the building up there. Those people, they are descendant of the Nabataeans. And those people, they used to live in the caves till 1980, 1988. And later, Queen Noor, the wife of the, uh, the late King Hussein, the American wife of the late King Hussein, she gave them the land up there and they gave them some money and they move, you know, from the caves and live in the village. That's because they want to keep Petra, it's uh, clear and uh, clean and for the archaeologists and for the visitor to go in and to go out. That's why they asked them to uh, move from the caves and live in the village. Now the Nabataeans, as I mentioned, they used to live in the mother of the system, which is far from here, about five kilometers. And Petra in the, in the beginning, it was a burial place. Then the second stage after Athenius attacked Petra, the mother, they move, uh, the, sorry, the Nabataeans, they move and live uh, inside Petra and they build their houses inside it. In 551 AD, the Nabataeans accommodation collapsed and destroyed by the earthquake, 551. Then after 551, the Nabataeans move and live in the caves. They took out all the, uh, the bones, the bodies, and they start living in the caves after 551 AD till 1980, 1988. 1980, 1988, they move them and live in the village. Every, every morning, they come down to Petra, riding, you know, horses, uh, donkeys, camels. In the evening time, they back to their village. So the village up there, we call it Um Saihun village. And the people who's living in, we call them Al Abdul family. And they are descendant of the Nabataeans. We're going to see them once we get down selling things. They thought it was the work of the genie or the spirit. And that's why you know they call it. But it's the, uh, the archaeologists, they found, you know, holes on the top where they used to bury the dead people in it. So it's burial places. But, you know, the local people and also, you know, in the brochures, they call it the I genie won't, I won't say a lot because he knows a whole lot about this place, but I just want to share a couple things that will relate to you. Genie, Islam believes that genies lived in portals. So did you ever see somebody, the tradition when somebody takes their wife and they, and thresholds, they take their wife and they cross over the threshold? That's based on Islam because they believe a genie lives there on the threshold and so you want to protect your wife and bring her over there. So they, the people here believe genies created these spirits. So they thought it was the work of the genie or the spirit. Now the second thing I, uh, we're going to talk about it, you know, the uh, inscription on the rock up there. That's the inscription of the rock over there. That's, you know, the, uh, might, uh, the ancient, you know, type of the uh, Arabic language. And that's, you know, the uh, Nabataeans use it. And that's, you know, the Nabataean, uh, the Nabataean inscription on the rock talk about, you know, the uh, tomb on the left side. Belong to a wealthy family. And that's, you know, a family tomb. Now, uh, the, uh, the tomb over there, we call it the Oplisk tomb. And we call it the Oplisk tomb because of the four Oplisks on the top. 
uh, from the number of the obelisk, and there is a statue in the middle of the two obelisks. We believe five people buried in the upper parts. So the upper part used as a burial place, the lower part used as a banqueting hall to commemorate the dead people in it. Mm. The Nabatin used to have, you know, special ceremonies for the dead people, and after the ceremonies, they took the bodies and buried them in the upper part. So the upper part, burial place, the lower part, uh, you know, a banqueting hall to commemorate the dead people in it. Now the two rooms on the right and on the left of the lower part, that's where they use it, you know, to keep some equipment or might for the guard to protect, you know, the, uh, the tomb. Now most of the decoration we are going to see it, it's a Greek influence. 70% of the Nabatian uh, decoration, it's a Greek influence. The Nabatian, they took influence from the Greek, from the Egyptian, from the Assyrian, from the Roman. So what you are, uh, see it up there, that's, you know, Egyptian influence. And uh, the, uh, the Nabatians, they believe like the Egyptians, that the spirit of the dead people goes to heaven through the obelisk. Mm -hmm. All right, so you see the obelisk, that's why, you know, they represent, you know, the upper part with the obelisk, Egyptian influence. Now we're going to see some of the simple, you know, tombs, as you see behind over there. That's, you know, for the common people. And you can see some of the, uh, you know, tombs without any decoration. So it was a burial place for the common uh, people. And later the Nabatean, they came and lived in it after 551 AD. Some of the tombs, you're going to see it with the cross tip decoration. As you see, one of the tomb over there and the other one up there. And you can see, you know, the cross tip decoration, that's Assyrian influence. Mm -hmm. And also the Nabatean, like the Assyrian, like the Egyptian, they thought the, uh, uh, the spirit of the dead people goes to heaven on the steps. Okay, we are at the main entrance of Petra, what we call it Sikh, S-I-Q. Sikh, it's an Aramic word, means the entrance or the way or the bath. That's the meaning of the Sikh. Sikh, it's natural faults or crack happens at the same time when the Great Rift Valley happens. So it was one piece, one mountain, then... Yeah, what I want to show you here is look at this. This is what's called the uh, Ptolemaic system of, uh, of understanding your universe. Ptolemy thought that the Earth was the center of the universe and that everything ran around it, including the moon and the sun. You have a calendar based on the Copernican system, which believes we're an ecocentric, not a heliocentric, uh, ecocentric, excuse me, this is eco. Copernican was, was uh, heliocentric, which means that we revolve around the sun. Now, why did I tell you that? Because Ptolemy thought everything revolved around the Earth, Ptolemaic system, and the Helio system, Copernicus, thought everything revolved around the sun. We, we revolved around the sun. The Islamics, or Islam, believes in a lunar calendar. You believe in a solar calendar. So that's why their, their, uh, their feast days go in different month days, and different days uh, fall on different days during the year. So this is a, this is a, a, a symbol of their, of their calendar and how they, how they tell time. This is based, again, on the Earth being the center, not the Sun being the center of our solar system. Okay? You'll see this stone, it's actually called Lithostrothos in Jerusalem. You'll see it, the, the, Ro the uh, Roman stone. Actually, Herod used it and then Hadrian used it also, went with him, so. Do you remember Caesarea Philippi? Yes. Remember I told you about the niches? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the Hellenistic or Greek influence. And you see the mountain, what is Sammy's telling you? See the mountain in there? That's their god. That's a mountain, that's not a mistake in there. That thing in the middle is the mountains, this mountain. So this is the same thing you see. You're seeing a Hellenistic influence over it, and that's a little niche. So every time you see those niches, know that some god is in there. This is a Stella stone.
Here we are in front of the treasury in, in Petra, the rock city of Petra. We just came down the sick about a quarter of a mile. Uh, it's famous for Indiana Jones movie, but more than that, uh, the original is from the Nabataeans. They lived somewhere in the neighborhood of about the third century to the second century or first century uh, BC. Uh, we know that they built this out of the pure rock. And uh, basically what we see here is a large place called the treasury. This is the, uh, this is the epitome of Petra. Uh, Petra continues to go down to the uh, left of me and it continues to narrow all the way down. After Petra and the Nabataeans lived here, there also the Romans came under the general Hadrian, built a Roman road and also a theater down at the bottom. Uh, very, very important spots scripturally because in Revelation, in chapter 12, it talks about the uh, Israel fleeing to the wilderness. We are really in the middle of the wilderness and uh, is believed to be Petra. The Old Testament word for it is Selah. And uh, the Bible says that the Antichrist will actually pursue the woman, uh, which is Israel, and will send a great flood. And this is a place that can easily flood uh, down through that sick. Matter of fact, it's done it many, many times before. So it's actually killed people when the, when the wadi uh, overflowed. Uh, the Bible also tells that an eagle with two wings, great wings, will help the woman, Israel. And that is possibly, in, in tribulation time, could possibly a remnant of the United States. And so here it is, the treasury house of Petra. Provide water for two and a half million people for 40 years. Well, there was a rock that followed them, the Bible tells us, and uh, it's a capital R in your Old Testament, it's a proper name. Another symbol for Jesus. That rock is not indigenous to this area, it wasn't found in this area. And the last place it stopped before they before they went into the Promised Land, or went to the Promised Land, was right here. Yeah. You know, spring, springs are on the bottom of mountains, not on the tops of them. So this thing is still, still producing water after 3,500 years, it's still coming out from the underneath of that rock, and that's that channel you saw. So I'm really not sure if you really try to take a little moment and comprehend it. If you want a spring, and people say, oh, it's just a spring, that's on the bottom of the mountains, especially in the desert. The desert, the water flows to the lowest spot. And so uh, to have a spring, you're gonna have to dig way down low. Look how high you are. That is a spring on the top of the mountain which really proves that that is exactly where God allowed water to come out. And that rock was a symbol of Christ. By the way, the Bible says it followed them. This is the last place it, la last place it rested. So it's a pretty amazing spot. In Numbers chapter 20, listen to what it says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye to the rock uh, before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered to the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of the rock. They were complaining and moaning. Okay. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. That's this rock. Okay, it had followed them and he, he smoked, he was supposed to speak to it and he struck it. That's the reason why, twice, that's the reason why he did not enter into the promised land, as I told you before, because of his, of rooting that shadow and type. But listen a little bit further. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of the Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. And Moses sent messengers from Kedesh unto the king of Edom. You've been in Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that has befallen us. So, uh, and then he asked them to pass over the king's highway, as a matter of fact, uh, right after that, and they say no. So this is the rock, this is the last spot in the rock that Moses stuck, the Wadi Musa, and the water is still coming out of it. Now let me read to you something from 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 1 through 4, listen to what it says. Uh, Paul speaks, he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not have you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is the Exodus. And they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, that's manna, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. By the way, in 1 Corinthians, it's a capital R. It's a proper name. It's not just a small r. And he says, and that rock was Christ. So that's how we know this is, a, this is symbolism, uh, literal, literally and symbolic Christ. It gave them water. Jesus later on in the New Testament would be the water of life. 
He would be struck only once, and then all you had to do is speak to Christ, and your sins could be forgiven. We don't, he's crucified once and for all. So this is a really amazing spot. Still having water, the congregation would have been down there as we came up the valley. So if you want to take your pictures, there's the channel, the water coming in. Of course, all this was built later uh, around this, but this is that spiritual rock. Any questions? All right, it's a great place. It really is a great spot. Let me tell you about Petra. If you look in your Bibles in Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12 is what's called an inter Fecal, no, not inter that's, that's, that's what I That's what I had done with me on chemo. I'm getting mixed up here. No, it's a parenthetical chapter or an interclarion chapter. What it means is it's, it's placed in the chronology of Revelation, but it doesn't come in chronological order. And what it is is it's a, I have to tell you this first, it is a, it is a summation of Israel. So Revelation chapter 12 is a history of Israel and it's from the beginning all the way to the end. It's a really neat chapter if you look at it. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit in verse 1. I won't read the whole thing. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailed in birth and pain to be delivered. Now if you remember, this will tie a lot of scripture together for you. The woman is representative of the Virgin of Mary. It's also representative of Israel. And the fact that she has the sun behind her, and you'll see her a lot of Catholic churches, you'll see this, and the moon under her feet, and then she has 12 stars. Remember, remember uh, Joseph's dream about his brothers? Remember he said you were like 12 stars? This is his dream. So God gave this dream way back to Joseph, and he said, I saw you bowing down to me. Well, that's because Joseph preserved the 12 tribes of Israel. But this is his dream. So uh, we also, I've taught a, store, a message on the, uh, or a study, on the study of the stars. Virgo the Virgin, it's been corrupted in astrology, but, but uh, in, actually in astronomy, Virgo is the first sign of what, what uh, the world calls the Zodiac. In Job, it's the Maseroth, the 12 signs. And they are powerful prophecies of Jesus. Before he came, while he was here, and when he's coming again, the last sign is, the, is Leo the Lion. Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So this woman image represents Israel, and of course, Mary is the, is the typification of a woman for Israel because she brings forth a son. And so she's travailing in pain. Israel travailed in pain to bring forth the Messiah. Mary travailed in, in pain to bring forth Jesus. So it's a lot, of, a lot of Bible in one chapter. So as it continues to go on, it talks about Israel and it talks about how, uh, how Satan is there and he saw another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon, and how his tail drew the third part of the stars. Uh, that's, that's actually when Satan fell, he took the third part of heaven with him, a third of the angels. And then it talks about, the, it's, and it's going to be talking about this war between the woman and between Lucifer. And it goes on and says, the, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And so a thousand three hundred and a uh, thousand two hundred and three score day, two hundred and three score days is 1260 days three and a half years if you look in the tribulation this is a lot to tell you okay but if you look in the tribulation it lasts seven years so this is a half right in the middle point of tribulation she is fleeing to the des to the desert to the wilderness you're in the wilderness um antichrist will really answer all the problems of the world up until about three and a half years into tribulation and then he will make the the abomination of desolation he will offer on the rebuilt Solomon's temple, he'll offer a sacrifice to himself. We know that Israel, through reading other parts of scripture, we know that Israel is going to have a national revival. We know that there's going to be 144,000 saved Jews that are actually going to lead a revival. We know that two witnesses will stand at the, at the gate and at the temple mount and they will oppose the Antichrist. Well, obviously, the Israel that's going to flee to the wilderness is this remnant that's revived. These are saved people during the tribulation, saved Jews. They're going to flee to, to, the, to Petra, the wilderness, and we'll tell you that in a moment. And although it doesn't mention the name Petra, every Bible scholar can reach back to the Old Testament and see that word Selah and know that that's the wilderness always re referred to. So let me skip down a little bit and tell you a little bit more. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, they loved not their lives till death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the and of the uh, sea. 
For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. That's Israel and Jesus. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. That's when I told you, if, a, if that's a symbol of America helping Israel, that she may fly into the wilderness, into her place. And her place is always called, is that, her place is called in the Old Testament, that place of Selah or, or the, rock, the rock city, uh, where she is nourished for a time and a times and half a time. That's the exact 1260 days, uh, which is said in a different way. And for the, from the face of the serpent, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you were in, you were in Petra, she's in the wilderness, a flood, and, and Sammy can tell you this. Uh, how many years ago did those people die in that uh, flash flood, Sammy? 19, 19 people died. What year was that? Do you remember the year? 1963. 1963. They were in Petra. Here's what happens. When it rains on the mountains, okay, uh, and it comes out, you have about two hours to get out of Petra. If you do not, you will be swept away with a torrential flood. I mean a flood that we, you will not be able to escape. You won't even be able to walk to the side. And you know how narrow it was? You won't be able to get into one of the, one of the buildings because... There's, uh, this is so dry that when it rains, you can see the erosion ditches and drains. You'll see this on the other side of the Dead Sea too, where people would be walking in a wadi, just a little, a little valley, and it would be dry. And, and uh, I, think, uh, I think there was 18 Australians that were, that were killed in the 80s because they were walking there. The flood came, it started in the mountains. By the time it saw, it's like a tidal wave. By the time it came down, it swept them away and they died. So that is a perfect spot for, the, for Satan to cast a flood against the women, the woman or, or Israel. So that's a perfect spot. So Petra is believed by almost all Bible scholars who understand eschatology to be the spot that that remnant of Israel is going to go to and the Antichrist is gonna pursue them. He will stop pursuing them. The earth will help the woman. Remember, we told you about the, about the sick and how it's an earthquake there. It's on the Syro-African Rift and you can actually see how one part fits in another. Well, the earth is gonna help the woman, which means there's gonna be another earthquake there once she goes there. And once he sends the flood, the earth's gonna open up and the water's gonna go into the, into the earth instead of into Petra to kill them. So it's a pretty powerful set of, set of scriptures. And uh, yeah, you can, you can do the movie. There's no question about it. So I will be in the movie. Sammy, Sammy has to be in the movie too though. <laughs> and Jamal driving us there so it's a pretty powerful set of verses that tell you about this prophecy that's coming so that's the answer to your question Rachel in short form all right